uh, Tatiana for the the introduction um, and thanks a lot for the opportunity to be able to give this the seminar um, which will be on uh, well I will cover in, in depth two two applications um, uh, of machine learning uh, related to beam losses and and beam dynamics in, in the LHC. So um, this is an outline of, of what I'll be talking about. Um, so first, I'll, uh, in, in just a single slide, review a few of the activities um, on which are investigating and studying the use of machine learning for different problems, different tasks in, in the LHC. And then I'll, um, I'll uh, since I have some time um, in this seminar, I'll, I'll uh, go into detail in the anomaly detection problem and also describe um, in, in, in a bit of detail uh, two algorithms that two unsupervised learning algorithms that we can use to uh, perform the task of anomaly detection, which are uh, local outlier factor and DB scan. Um, and these techniques, I'll, I'll then, we'll, we'll then see how we can um, use these techniques um, applied for two problems. Um, the first of which is detecting issues with the um, beam collimation hierarchy in the LHC um, using um, recordings, measurements from, from beam loss monitors. And the second application, um, which is um, that of dynamic aperture simulations, is, is to see whether there are any anomalies um, pertaining to, for instance, a particular seed or a particular configuration um, of the simulation um, for, for dynamic aperture. So, um, this is um, a short summary, uh, actually. Um, you can have a look at this, this um, paper offline, um, but we, we try to collect a bit um, the, uh, the ongoing work um, related to machine learning and applications of machine learning at the, at the LHC. Um, so some of these you'll, you'll get to know about in uh, talks in this um, uh, OWLE uh, series. Um, so there'll be one by Gabriella on the 24th of November. So that will focus on the automation of the LHC collimator alignment using machine learning. Um, some other um, applications are that of optics measurements and corrections, um, in particular um, detection of anomalies um, in BPM readings. Um, you'll be hearing a bit more about dynamic, dynamic aperture studies in the second half of this talk. And also, um, um, there, there's also ongoing work on optimization of, of the beam lifetime. Um, so deter using a, a gradient uh, boosted decision tree to determine the optimal set of uh, operational knobs for, for the LHC. And there, there are also, of course, uh, other um, uh, uh, activities ongoing. Uh, so for instance, um, one of the attendees here is a PhD student of mine, Leander. So he's also working on um, a better um, tune estimation algorithm. So using machine learning um, to, to better estimate the, the tune in, in the LHC. So um, with that, I'll move on to the anomaly detection problem. So um, when we speak about anomalies, um, we, we, we talk of, of three different categories of anomalies. Um, so we have the point anomalies. Um, this is actually the main focus of, of today's seminar. So here we're talking of individual data points, which are anomalous with respect to the surrounding data. Uh, we have contextual anomalies. So for instance, um, th these are very context dependent. So for instance, in a time series, if we have uh, a temperature at a particular point in time, then the temperature may be low or may be high, but it really depends on, on whether um, it is expected that it is low or high at that point in time. Um, and then finally, we have the collective anomalies. So when we have a, a whole pattern, for instance, which is, um, um, let's say, missing, for instance, or, or which is, which is um, different with respect to the usual pattern that one would expect. So um, in this simple example of a heartbeat signal, um, if we have um, no signal in this portion, then that indicates that we have an anomaly. So in, in order to um, explain a bit the, the um, outlier detection, how an outlier detection algorithm would work, um, we can start with a very simple approach, which is the uh, distance-based approach, um, which is the, the K nearest neighbors algorithm. And then we'll use the principles that um, are in, in this um, KNN algorithm 
to um, explain um, a more, um, let's say, developed algorithm, which is the local outlier factor, which is a density-based approach. So in, in the K and N distance um, algorithm, um, of course, outliers are objects which are going to be far away from others. Um, and we want to compute an outlier score um, as simply the distance to the K nearest neighbor. So depending on what value of K we choose, then um, the distance, the Euclidean distance will, will give us the, the outlier score. So in this very simple example here, we have a group of points um, in some um, parameter space. This is a 2D space, but this is just for illustration. It can be any number of dimensions. And um, here we have a point. And um, if, if we set K to five, so we're looking at the fifth nearest neighbors, then the, the fifth nearest neighbor might be, for instance, this point, and the distance from this point to point C would be the anomaly score, the, the outlier score that would give to point C. So since the distance is significant, then um, as you can see, it gets quite a, a high score. So um, uh, we, it, it actually has the highest score from this data set. So this means that C is, is most likely a, an anomaly, which, which it is. Um, of course, we might have different variations. Um, so we might have, for instance, a group of two points here. And as you can see now, um, uh, it's, it's um, a, a bit um, different in, in, in the sense that the score value um, decreases slightly because now we have um, a, a point which is closer here. And for instance, maybe this point here has um, uh, the, the fifth nearest neighbor is, is, um, is, is also um, a bit far away. Um, uh, so, um, but, but for instance, in, in, in this third example here, we have um, uh, a group of five points uh, where we can see that um, since we're, we're setting K is five, then e each of these gets assigned to be an anomaly because um, if we look at their fifth neighbor, the, the fifth nearest neighbor is going to be one of these points here. So even though we have a cluster of points, um, these are all deemed to be anomalies because um, they are far away from the fifth nearest neighbor, which is somewhere here. So depending on the value of K, so if we set a value of K to be smaller than that, then um, uh, these would actually be normal points. So th this is just an, an example to show how sensitive um, it is to the value of K. Um, and yet another um, example, um, this is to show different densities. So if, if we have a cluster here of points which are at a particular density, uh, which, which is a low density, and another cluster of points here, which is at a high density. Um, then you, as you can see, the, the points in, in this cluster um, have a, a very low um, uh, outlier score because they're, they're quite close to their neighbors. Whereas over here, the outlier score would be um, slightly higher. However, they might still belong to two normal clusters. Um, and on the other hand, point C here is, is always the furthest away from um, all of the remaining points. So it always gets the highest outlier score. Um, so, for instance, here, the point D might be an outlier. Um, you, you can clearly see that it's, it's, it's distinct from, from this cluster here, but still its outlier score is less than um, some of the points which are in this looser cluster over here. Um, so the advantages of the KNN algorithm are that it's, it's quite easy to define this uh, proximity measure because it's simply the Euclidean distance as opposed to perhaps taking the statistical distribution. Um, uh, and we don't get, let's say, a, a binary output like anomaly or not anomaly, but we actually get a score, which is quite useful because it, it gives us an indication of how, how much this point is an outlier. Um, we can deal quite naturally with, with having multiple structures or so might have multiple clusters, um, but that's an issue if um, the, uh, the data has a widely variable density uh, as, as we have seen in, in the previous example. So um, that's, that's why um, we, um, uh, we, we might want to use a local outlier factor algorithm because in, in this particular um, algorithm, um, outliers are objects not only if they're far away from others, but if they are in regions of low density. Um, so um, we compute instead a relative density outlier score, which is, um, we, we'll see the equations um, later on, but it's the reciprocal of the average distance um, to the k nearest neighbors uh, relative to that of those k neighbors. 
Um, so if we define the um, n of uh, nk of a, which is the, the set of the k nearest <coughs> of a particular point a, and the k distance um, of a is the, the distance of that object a to its k nearest neighbors, then uh, we can define a reachability distance uh, between a point a and a point b, which is the maximum uh, between the k distance of b and the Euclidean distance between a and b. Um, and that lets us define the local reachability distance of a point A, uh, which is the reciprocal of the, the sum overall um, points in, in the neighborhood of A, um, uh, the, the sum of all the reachability distances between A and B divided by the, the number of um, neighbors um, of, of point A. Um, and then we can get these um, uh, the, the actual uh, local outlier factor score for a point A, which is um, the, uh, the, it's basically an expression in terms of the, the ratio of the local reachability distances of points B and, and A um, divided by the, uh, the number of, of points. But at, at the end, we, we get um, a value, uh, which is um, basically we get a value of one if, if our point A has a similar density to its neighbors a value of less than one if it's an inlier, and a value of greater than one if um, it has a lower density than its neighbor, so it is um, considered to be an outlier. Um, so here we have an example of, of that. So this is the same example, uh, the, the same data set that we saw earlier, but uh, this time using the local outlier factor. So the points A, D, and C um, are all considered to be outliers with, uh, with LOF, uh, whereas with, with KNN, uh, we would only get uh, point C basically being um, an outlier or, or perhaps point A. Um, so, um, so, so this is um, uh, a step ahead because um, this, this algorithm also takes into account the, the density um, of the surrounding area. Um, so so that's, that's its, its main advantage. Um, it still suffers from um, issues like the fact that we need to, to choose K. So K is basically our hyperparameter that we need to pick. And also um, it's um, quite, a, let's say, computationally expensive um, order of N squared. So let's see the LOF algorithm now applied to um, a particular problem, which is that of um, detecting issues with the beam collimation hierarchy. Um, so just as a summary for you, those of you who are not um, aware of the uh, LHC collimation system, but the, the LHC is equipped with um, approximately 50 double-sided collimators per beam. And these are used to clean um, halo particles before they can reach the superconducting magnets. And uh, the schematic, sh schematic shows how they are arranged in uh, a multi-stage hierarchy uh, such that they can optimize um, the overall uh, cleaning efficiency. So we have um, the beam coming in from this side and primary collimators first, uh, which are at the, at the tightest gap. Uh, these intercept the primary beam. Um, some of those um, yeah. particles um, are uh, deflected uh, and, and they form the secondary beam halo. And, and that's why we have to have secondary collimators and also absorbers and tertiary collimators later on to absorb uh, the showers and, and the tertiary um, halo. Um, and in this schematic here, you can see how these are um, collimators are arranged in the LHC. Um, so we have um, beam one in blue and uh, beam two in red, and um, they're also um, installed in different IRs um, in insertion regions, depending on whether they are momentum cleaning or uh, beta tone cleaning uh, collimators. Um, so we need, of course, feedback. Um, so we, we need instrumentation to be able to measure how well the, the uh, collimation hierarchy is set up. And we do that using beam loss monitors. So overall in the LHC, there are some 3,600 of these BLMs. Um, uh, we can see an example here of a BLM, which is installed right behind uh, downstream of a collimator. And um, they can record 12 different integration times, um, which we find logged in the database at one hertz. Um, typically for collimation related analysis, because we look at multi-turn, uh, we use the, the 1.3 second running sum and that's the, the running sum which um, I, I used in, in my analysis. Um, so 
we need, of course, to qualify the collimation hierarchy. Um, so this, this means that once we set up the collimators to the beam using the beam-based alignment procedure, we still need to, to see how well the, the hierarchy is set up. So are the collimators at the right positions, basically? So to do this, we, um, um, we artificially excite the beam um, in a dedicated um, um, fill to, to generate high losses in the transverse plane, for instance, in the horizontal plane or the vertical plane. And this gives us um, uh, the distribute. If we look at the distribution of the losses in, in the ring, um, we get a beam loss map. Um, so each of these bars here represents the recording of a BLM. So this is a snapshot um, in time of, of uh, the distribution of the losses. Um, and the bars, which are blue, those are um, indicate BLMs, which are located in cold regions of the machine. Um, in black, we have the um, collimators, um, black and gray actually in this plot. Um, in red, we have the um, uh, BLMs which are located in, in the warm insertions and uh, green are um, uh, special devices, um, insertable devices known as, as Roman pots. Um, but if, if we zoom in this, in this section of, the, uh, of the, the beam loss map, we can see in more detail, um, the collimation hierarchy in, uh, in action in, in IR7, which is the, the region for Betatron offset cleaning. Um, so we can see, first of all, so the beam is coming from the, um, the left um, into, so moving from the left towards the right. And the highest losses, as we would expect, are the primary collimators, um, followed by the secondaries and, and the absorbers. And um, what's important is, of course, we look at the uh, leakage of uh, losses into the uh, cold region here, because if we have high losses over there, that means that uh, we are at risk of quenching the superconducting magnets um, if, if the losses get too high. Um, however, generally, wh wh whereas, so wh why we tend to look quantitatively at, at the leakage at the dispersion suppressor and, and make sure it's below a certain threshold, um, typically the hierarchy itself is analyzed qualitatively. So um, we don't go into detail into the, let's say, um, detailed comparison of, of uh, uh, these different values. We, we just um, uh, ensure that qualitatively, it, it seems that the hierarchy, the hierarchy is, is, is in place. Um, so what, what I did was in this study was we, we, um, uh, we used the local outlier factor algorithm um, to determine whether um, a particular loss map um, taken in a particular beam and, a partic and in a particular plane is anomalous with respect to other, um, let's say, good or normal loss maps. So um, to do this, of course, we had to um, uh, gather a, a data set. So the, these loss maps are typically taken mostly during the uh, start of the year when we have the, the beam commissioning, but also at individual checkpoints throughout the year, such as after a technical stop. Um, but they're also done during um, dedicated studies when we want to study, for instance, a particular, um, a new set of settings, for instance, for the collimators, um, such as, um, for example, in this particular machine development, we wanted to uh, push the, the limits of the, the hierarchy and, and put in the, the tight, what are the so-called tight collimator settings. And you can see how the loss map changes between the standard collimator settings um, done during commissioning and the, the tight collimator settings. So for instance, over here, we get an increase in losses because the collimators, uh, secondaries, for instance, are, are closer to the, the primaries um, and, and closer to the beam. Um, so that's, that's one, that, that's obviously something which we can see um, with a visual check, um, which can be detected but with a visual check. Um, and the idea was to see whether we could um, use um, a local outlier factor to, to also detect such a change. Um, so in the analysis, um, we used the, um, the 77, um, so that there are um, 77 uh, BLMs uh, at higher seven collimators for B1 and B2. And, um, First, uh, PCA was used to reduce the dimensionality of that to two dimensions so that we can visualize um, the, the different loss maps. Um, and here you see the, um, the visualization just for B1 horizontal loss maps taken at flat top energy of 6.5 TeV. And you can see clearly that there, there's a group of points here which are, are clustered together. So they're 
kind of normal loss maps. But there are two points here. So um, loss map 10 and loss map 12, um, these happen to correspond to um, uh, the, the cases where we had um, nominal settings in the in the in sigma and beam sigma in, in the machine. Um, uh, there are actually two points because we can see the, the result of uh, the loss map before doing the beam based alignment and after doing the beam based alignment. So it's quite clear that there is a difference between these, these two points and, and, and the, the, the normal loss maps. Um, so if we then look at the, out, the results of the local outlier factor, so um, this is um, applying the LOF on the original 77 dimensions, um, we see that these two points um, appear to be very anomalous because um, their, their, their value is, is quite um, greater than, than one, whereas all the other points um, are roughly um, in liars or let's say no, normal points. Um, then we did a test which was to make a, a very small shift in um, the center of one of the collimators, which is an absorber um, in this location here, um, by 200 microns at injection energy with respect to the uh, operational settings. Um, and as you can, so th this is the, the loss map before and the loss map after. So the change is, um, I mean, it is noticeable if you had to, to see these two loss maps side by side, but um, if you're doing just a qualitative check, um, this wouldn't ring, raise any alarm bells because the hierarchy is, is still um, maintained. Um, but if we were to look at the um, PCA decomposition and also at the score that we obtained, we can see that this loss map is actually um, uh, quite different uh, with respect to the, the, the other loss maps. So, so that's um, uh, a kind of validation to show that um, even with such um, a change, which is not, which is less evident, and this was still picked up by uh, the principal component analysis and, and the LOF. Okay, um, so that was the first example. Um, so I'll move on to the, uh, the second application of um, anomaly detection, which is uh, dynamic aperture. So unlike the previous work, which is um, now dating some, some couple of years back, um, the, this is an ongoing work um, in co collaboration with uh, Massimo Giovannozzi and uh, Frederick van der Wecken from ABP at CERN. And um, the idea is to, to study, um, to, to see whether we can automatically detect anomalies in dynamic aperture simulations. So the A is essentially the, the extent of a um, simply connected region of the phase space um, in, in which um, the particle motion is, is bounded um, for a given number of turns. And uh, we get such a, a volume. Um, it's shaped essentially by, um, uh, for instance, nonlinear magnetic errors in the LHC. Um, uh, and um, typically it's, it's um, difficult to obtain um, the detailed knowledge of, of errors which might be presented present in the magnetic fields. Um, so usually what we do is we do a, or they do a Monte Carlo approach where the tracking simulations are done um, for different um, random realizations of the machine, uh, which we call seeds, and over also a different set, uh, a given set of initial conditions, which is uh, uniformly distributed in, in polar coordinates, um, and these give us different angles. Um, so if, if we plot um, the, so the result of a simulation, so we have here uh, 11 distinct angles, and um, each for each of these angles, we have 60 different seeds. So um, each of these points, as you see here, is the, the resulting dynamic aperture after a number of turns um, for each configuration. And um, we might get um, quite a variation, as you can see, in dynamic aperture um, from seed to seed. And we might also get, in some cases, outliers. So as you can see, there are a few points here, these three points or four points, uh, which are distinct from, from the, the rest of the, the points. Um, so there, there are physical reasons, perhaps, which, which I'd explain this. So for instance, um, the fact that the distribution of the nonlinear magnetic errors might um, excite some particular resonances, which might be C-dependent. Um, uh, and, um, and, and also, since these outliers might represent um, some un unlikely configuration, 
um, uh, it might be useful to, to remove these from the, the analysis um, to be able to compute the, the minimum DA. So the data set that we used was um, well, well, quite a, a large data set made up of different um, categories of so different machines, um, LHC or HLLHC, um, also different energies, injection or flat top, um, the different beam uh, as well, and also different um, optical um, configurations. Um, for the LHC, it was either nominal or ATS, and then the different versions for HLLHC and also uh, different strengths of the, the octopole magnets. So we, we tried um, two approaches. Uh, first, a supervised learning approach using SVMs. Um, these were trained on a subset of this, this data set because we had to label the data set. So um, this was, of course, uh, uh, time consuming tasks. So, so we had 300 studies, um, which corresponds to around 140,000 um, seeds and angles. And then the um, unsupervised learning, uh, what we did was we tried dbscan and LOF on the full data set then, so on just over 5,000 studies. So um, before we could, so, so first of all, there was also a constraint that um, we're only considering an outlier if it's at a minima or a, or a maxima. So we're not considering cases where we have, we could have multiple clusters, for instance. Um, uh, but in, in any case, we, we had to perform um, a procedure of um, extracting, um, so to, to create the input for, for SVM and, and for the unsupervised learning methods, we had to um, uh, first um, extract the, the 60 DA points for each, for each angle and then scale them separately so that we get, we get uh, zero mean and unit variance for each input. Um, and then uh, we have the, the vec this, this vector that we create and the corresponding label, um, binary label basically, uh, which are used to train the, the support vector machine. And um, these are the results that, that we obtained. So um, this is not a single result over the whole data set, but it's actually a learning curve. So it's just a different way of, um, um, let's say, sh showing the results um, because um, it also lets you see the, um, how the, the performance is changing as you increase the size of the data set. So that, that's what we have on the x-axis. So it's the number of training points used to train the, the SVM. And in this graph, we have the uh, true positive rate, false positive rate, and false negative rate. And in this one here, you see just the true negative. So the, when we have a true positive, that means that the ground truth was an anomaly and the prediction is also anomaly. So the SVM is correctly predicting the anomaly. Um, and the opposite case is the true negative. So when we have a true negative, the ground truth is normal and the prediction is, is also normal. Um, whereas false, false positives and false negatives are the, um, let's say the, the combinations in between. Um, so as we can see, we have, we have quite a large number of true negatives because the data set is very skewed. So there, there is only a very small number of um, uh, um, anomalies, um, but a, a very large number of, of normal points. Um, and as we plot the um, true positive uh, rate, false positive rate and false negative rate versus the number of, of training points, we see that um, uh, when, when the training data set is, is close to, to being balanced between um, anomalous and normal points, um, then um, the, uh, so, so that is here at the start, the, the, the number of true positives is, is quite high. Um, however, as, as we increase the number of normal points, so we, we increase the skewness towards normal points, um, we get a lower and lower performance, uh, which is understandable because um, classifier, I mean, typical classifier algorithms like the SVM um, typically assume that there is a balance between the two classes um, so that there isn't a, a skewness. So um, that brings us then to the dbscan algorithm. So we, we said, let's, let's use unsupervised learning instead and um, use anomaly detection and another anomaly detection method to um, detect these anomalies. So in dbscan, it's it's also relies on um, on the concept of, of density. So we still have um, this this notion of of uh, density. Um, the difference 
with respect to, for instance, other clustering algorithms like k-means is that we don't specify the number of clusters in advance. And the basic idea is that we want to group together points in high density and the outliers are those points which are basically lying alone in the low density regions. Um, I'll speed a bit through this um, uh, description of the algorithm because I think we're slightly running out of time, but um, basically dbscan, if, if you ever get to use this, this method, um, you'll see that you have to specify two hyperparameters essentially, which are the epsilon, um, which is uh, the, the radius for, a, for defining the neighborhood of a particular point P and the minimum number of points. So this is the, the, the minimum number of points um, in, in a given neighborhood um, N of P that we want to consider. So how do we define high density? Um, uh, this is when um, our epsilon neighborhood contains of a particular point um, contains at least min points. If, if it contains at least min points, then we're in a high density neighborhood. Um, so for instance, um, in um, for point P, so P has four points in its um, neighborhood. So um, if uh, min points is four, then the um, the neighborhood of, of point P is, is, is has a high density. And for point Q, since it has three points, then if, if we have the parameter min point set to four, then the density will be low. Um, we can also have different categories of a particular point. So this can be either a core point, a border point, or uh, an outlier, which is what we, we want to get out from this um, uh, method. Um, and um, okay, then there are a few other um, definitions uh, following on from local outlier factor, but in this, in this case, it's related to density be density reachable um, ness. So uh, a point Q is directly density reachable from some point P if P is a core point. Um, so it means it's in a region of high density. Um, and um, Q is also in P's uh, neighborhood. Um, uh, then this allows us, for instance, to construct, this is how then clusters are formed because um, we can basically keep on adding points to this, this cluster because they are all density reachable from each other. Um, uh, and, and that means we have, we have a cluster. And um, we also have the, the concept also of density connectivity. So um, a pair of points P and Q, which are on opposite ends of this cluster here are, are density connected if they are all density reachable from um, some point um, O, which is in the center of this cluster. Um, so that allows us to define um, uh, a cluster um, formally. Um, so I won't spend too much more time on this. Um, um, just to show some examples of what we would get, for instance, with different um, parameter settings. So for instance, here we have our original data set. And um, here we have the result of dbscan um, for uh, epsilon value of 10 and the minimum points value of four. So we get um, the green points here. Th those are our core points. So those all form um, clusters. Um, uh, the blue points are uh, border points. They're still part of the cluster because they're not um, anomalies. Wh whereas the red points are actually the, the outliers which we can consider as, as anomalies. Um, if we change the epsilon value to five, so that's the difference going from here to here. We're going from 10 to five. We actually get then distinct clusters. So we can actually say that this group of points here is distinct from this um, brown group of points over here. So um, uh, then we still have the, the outliers um, on, the, on the edges. All right, so um, we apply the dbscan to, the, to these um, uh, DA points, dynamic aperture points, and um, we then also applied um, a post-processing on, on, on this result. Um, uh, essentially, these, these are basically um, steps. So for instance, the distance from, from the mean of the cluster um, should be at least two sigma away. Um, uh, uh, the distance to the nearest uh, regular points should also be at least 0 0.15 in, in normalized space. 
and um, the distance to the nearest regular points should be at least um, some percentage of the, the total spread of the regular points. So this was done in order to um, uh, try and reduce the, the number of false positives because we were seeing that the true positive rate was, was high, but also the false positive rate. Um, and, and that could, could happen because uh, we might have um, uh, strongly packed clusters um, and um, when, when you normalize the points, you might still get some points which, which are um, determined, uh, deemed to be outliers. So um, here we have two examples. Um, so a, a, an example where we were, um, where dbscan is, is successful. So we, we can see that these two points here are, are labeled correctly as, as outliers. Um, but here we have an example of a false positive. So um, the thread point here is, is deemed to be a false positive, whereas um, these um, two um, green points here and this green point here are, are correctly predicted as, as outliers. Um, so if we compare all of the um, um, these different methods, so we see that in terms of true negatives, there is not much difference uh, between the methods. Um, so uh, as VM is, is still able to predict um, a true negative, so a normal point as well as DB scan or, or LOF. Um, uh, but the difference arises when we, we talk about um, um, essentially the, the false negatives and the um, uh, false positives. So um, for the, the false negatives, we have um, SVM is, is actually um, is not predicting as many false negatives, but LOF is. Um, uh, and then, however, if we if we look at, for instance, the DB scan and also the um, post-processing after the DB scan, we see that um, the false negative rate is actually um, much lower. Um, also, then this is where the SVM does, does um, poorly, which is in the false positives. So in the false positives, uh, SVM gives quite a high number of false positives. But then if we um, look at uh, DB scan and also the um, DB scan with the post processing, we see that the false positive rate is significantly uh, reduced. Uh, we also tried uh, another combination, uh, well, uh, another um, um, operation, which is the binary or on the result of the DB scan and the LOF, just to see if, if that gave any meaningful results, uh, which, which it, it didn't really. Then if we look at the um, outliers and their dependence on uh, seed and angle, so here we see th these are all the outliers which were detected as a function of the angle of the, the simulation. And uh, this is uh, the number of, of outliers as a function of the seed number. So we can see that uh, there are certain, so for instance, low angles um, have a, a lower number of, the, of anomalies than, than high angles. Um, and also, if we look at the seeds, there are three particular seeds which have a significantly higher number of anomalies. So, um, uh, ABP is, um, the ABP team is, is investigating these, these uh, discrepancies to better understand um, why this, this might be the case. All right, so um, coming to the conclusion. So, um, We've seen that, well, you're probably all well aware that anomaly detection is a, a key task in particle accelerators. And we've seen a couple of examples where we use machine learning in order to um, solve these, these problems or, or try to understand these problems. Um, and also one important point that perhaps I'd like to, to take home is the fact that um, unsupervised methods um, when dealing with um, skew data sets are probably going to work better, um, I, I think. And um, we've seen in a bit of detail the two, two anomaly detection methods, which are the, the local outlier factor and the DB scan, and uh, their applications essentially to, um, to anomaly detection problems, which were those of the collimation hierarchy and the beam loss maps and the uh, DA uh, simulations. All right, um, and just my final slide for today, I just um, perhaps is, well, an advertisement, but um, I'm the guest editor of a, a special issue on uh, machine learning and accelerator technology. So this is um, uh, a special issue of, of a journal from MDPI, which um, 
is um, accepting currently papers and, and uh, submissions um, which uh, are related to these topics. So if you are interested in submitting a paper, um, uh, please check out the uh, journal website and um, maybe let me know if, if you are interested in, in submitting. All right, so from my side, that was it. Um, so thanks a lot and let me know in case you have any any questions.